Franklin, and this is Cross My Heart Ministry. Thanks for stopping by my channel. This week, because I've been preparing to teach at a women's retreat this weekend, I invited a few months ago my good friend Gina Fransky to fill in for me, and you are in for a treat. Gina is a marvelous Bible teacher. She did a great job, as I knew she would, unpacking truth from 1 Samuel 28. Now, this is an interesting, really strange, and almost creepy sort of chapter, as it shows us and, and, and chronicles Saul approaching the witch at Endor to pull up the spirit of Samuel to get some answers that he needs. I love the way Gina unpacked that truth for us. She talked about how Saul was so desperate and she carved out for us and laid out for us a clear distinction between this sort of holy desperation, which is seeking after God, and then this worldly desperation, which is what we are so easily drawn to do when times are difficult, and, and those desperate times that sometimes call for desperate measures. It's so easy, even as women of God who have been redeemed by God, to give ourselves a pass and to give ourselves permission to go there, to resort to desperate, ungodly, sinful means to justify what we need to do. But that woman of God who's following God knows that those hard times make us desperate for Christ. They have us needing Him and dependent upon Him. They change the way we pray. They change the way we study the Word. And so we know as we walk with the Lord for many years, when we look back over our shoulder, it's those difficult times that truly draw us to deeper intimacy and deeper reliance on the Lord Jesus Christ. I hope you'll stay tuned and listen to this week's teaching lecture in its entirety because you are in for a treat from my good friend Gina. Thanks so much for watching. This is Cross My Heart Ministry. Leave us a note as usual. Let us know what resonates with you. Thanks to all of you who have already subscribed. And if you haven't yet, it doesn't cost you a thing, but it sure does bless our ministry if you'll just click that subscribe button. Until next week, I'm Laura McFarland, and this is Cross My Heart Ministry. Well, ladies, we are in for a big treat today because Gina Fransky is in the house. And so I'm so excited to welcome Gina to come over and do this week's teaching for us. Gina has been on staff at, for, at uh, Cross Church in Springdale. It began as First Baptist Church since 1991. Is that right? She's 1992. She started when she was about five years old. When you look at her, you're going to think, oh my goodness, how could she possibly have been on church staff that long? She's a dynamo. Gina loves the Lord. She loves the Word. She is the director of women's ministries there, and she also heads up the First Impressions ministry. So she juggles lots of balls, spins lots of plates, wears lots of hats. I'm mixing all those metaphors, but you need lots of metaphors to describe a woman like Gina. Uh, she's married to Ed. She describes him as her best friend. And she has two daughters, Caitlin and Meredith. Uh, they are both seniors. One is a senior in high school and one is a senior in college. And so every mother in this room knows how busy a senior year can be. So she wears lots of hats, but she wears them all very, very well. So um, I want to ask you to give a nice hearty welcome to Gina Fransky, my friend. And so thank you for being with us. She is going to unpack some truth from this passage about desperate times and desperate measures and how desperate we are for Jesus. So I'm going to pray for Gina as we jump in and get started. So Lord God, you are uh, ever faithful and we do desperately need you. And so I, I just pray blessing upon this woman of God this morning. I pray that as she... Um, unpacks the truth from the scripture and, and shares with us what you have taught her. I want to thank you for her careful and her prayerful preparation and thank you in advance for the truth that we're going to hear. I just pray God that your words will be on her tongue, your love will be in her heart and your thoughts would be in her mind and you would allow her to speak courageously and boldly and that our hearts and our minds would be sharp and open to receive the truth that you have for us. You are good and you are great and we love you and we desperately need you. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Do you want to just carry it? Or I think I'll hold it. Okay. If I need to change, I will. All righty. I'm going to get my water set up. I probably I always have water when I'm speaking. I never drink it while I'm speaking, but... Um, thank you for having me here this morning. I am I'm so glad to be here. I love coming over here. I love the sweet kindred spirit that you have here. It's precious. And I love Laura. Y'all are so blessed to have her. Bring it on. She is a friend, and I love her heart for you. 
I love her heart for the Word of God, and I love her heart for our Lord Jesus Christ, and you are so blessed to have her. So I, I'm kind of with fear and trembling standing in her place this morning, but I am grateful. Um, I do want to say I love Joy of Living Bible Study. It is my hands-down favorite study. Um, just a little story about Joy of Living. When I was in college back in the late 80s, I'm, I'm telling you my age now, um, I was invited for the first time to a women's Bible study at my church. And a sweet lady from church, she was a young Mary, uh, probably in her 30s, she came up, came up to me at church and said, would you like to be at my table for women's Bible study? And I said, well, I'm a student at the university and I have class on Tuesday. She said, well, we have a, a nighttime gathering. And so I decided, I don't know. I just said, well, that sounds like fun. I said, yes, and uh, jumped in. And it was Joy of Living Bible Study. We did the book of Genesis. I think Laura has taught y'all through the book of Genesis my junior year. And then we did the book of Exodus my senior year. And I look back at that time in my life, and it was definitely a season for me when God, number one, set a new love in my heart for his word. I mean radically during those two years of study. And then just the call to ministry that he put on my life that came from that time. So very thankful and very grateful for the study. When Laura sent me the um, lesson for today and I saw what she gave me to teach on, I was like, that little singer, um, she's giving me the text of the spirit of Samuel. Um, okay, <laughs> so um, I just chuckled to myself, and we laughed about it earlier this morning, and had a good time with it, and as I began to prepare and study several weeks ago, I, I went through and did your lesson, just as you did, and just began to study the text. The Lord put such a powerful word on my heart, and I'm excited to share with you this morning. Now, how we're going to do this is I'm just going to, we're just going to walk through the text this morning, Okay. Um, I'm going to pretty much go verse by verse, and we're going to we're going to read sections at a time, and we'll stop and we'll ponder that, and we'll just see what the Lord has for us this morning. Amen. Well, let's jump in and get started with this, and I'm going to just begin, if it's okay, in Samuel, First uh, Samuel 28, and we're just going to read verses three through six. Now Samuel had died. And all Israel had mourned for him and buried him in Ramah, his own city. And Saul had put the mediums and the necromancers out of the land. The Philistines assembled and came and encamped in Shunem. And Saul gathered all Israel and they encamped in Gilboa. When Saul saw the army of the Philistines, he was afraid. And his heart trembled greatly. And when, Saul, and when Saul inquired of the Lord, the Lord did not answer him, either by dreams or Urim or prophets. Now let's stop right here. I want to talk about this little section and then we're going to go on. What we have here in verse 3 is simply some information. Okay, He's given us some information in verse 3. We're going to come back to that in just a second. But verse 4 is where the real beginning of the action of this chapter begins to take place. You see, we have the Philistine armies are gathering in great numbers here in Shunem. And this is really the beginning of a new military campaign that the Philistine ruler, Achish, describes in verses 1 and 2. And this is the battle that David had been pulled into as a result of living among the Philistines and lying about his allegiance. And we learned earlier, as y'all have been reading through 1 Samuel, how David found himself in a terrible situation and position of being expected to fight for the Philistines against Israel. But when it comes to understanding the rest of chapter 28, what we really need to see here is Saul's reaction in verse 5. And we read that when Saul saw the Philistine army, he was afraid, and his heart trembled 
greatly. When he put his eyes on that massive army, he was shattering in his boots. Akish had really done it. This army had massive force and size, and it absolutely horrified Saul. But the scariest part of this whole situation is what happens in verse 6, and it says, When Saul inquired of the Lord, it says, The Lord did not answer him. Whoa. Either by dreams, are Urim, or prophets. Now let me stop there, and I want to talk about those three things right there. Dreams, Urim, or prophets. I'm not going to go deep into this, but if you think about these days and times in historical Bible times, and if they didn't have the written word of God as we have it, and God had to communicate to his people. So we know stories in the written scripture where God communicates through dreams. We've seen that. We've seen how he communicates through the prophets. There's this other little word there, Urim, which is very strange. I had to do a little research on this because I myself did not know. I knew it had something to do with the priest. And I did a little research on it. And Urim was a satchel of sticks and, I don't know, objects that the priest would open up and lay out, and the Lord would use those to speak to the priests about what they should do. Very strange. And I thought it was very strange when I read it. I thought, Lord, that's, that's strange. But if you think about it, God can choose to speak to us any way he wants. Amen? And why this is, these words are written here in Scripture is because The writer wants us to understand that all the ways that God would speak to Saul, he wasn't speaking to him through any of the ways that God would communicate to man. Nothing. God did not answer Saul. He was silent. Now, it's not hard for us to imagine what Saul was feeling at this point. Have you ever felt God being silent? Like you can't hear him? It's a scary place to be. That God was not answering Saul. And here's Saul at this point of really being outmatched militarily. (laughs) He's about to get crushed. And he's directionless spiritually. And the best word, I think, that describes Paul at this moment might be absolutely desperate. I have some, I looked up some definitions of desperate just in the standard dictionary and The first definition said, feeling, showing, or involving a hopeless sense that a situation is so bad as it is impossible to deal with. I'm going to read that again. Feeling, showing, or involving a hopeless sense that a situation is so bad that it is impossible to deal with. Have any of you ever felt that way? I know I have. Have you been in a situation that seems so bad, and because it's so impossible to to deal with, you have become absolutely desperate. Perhaps you may be feeling a little desperate this morning. I hope God speaks into your heart through this. If you keep reading in the dictionary, there's another definition, maybe two or three down, and it really shows, it's the definition of really the actions of a, desperate, of a desperate person, and I thought this was intriguing. It reads, involving or employing extreme measures in an attempt to escape defeat or frustration. Involving or employing extreme measures in an attempt to escape defeat or frustration. And sadly, this definition right here is a perfect segue into our next section of scripture. Let's start and pick up with verse 7. Then Saul said to his servant, Seek out for me a woman who is a medium, that I may go to her and inquire of her. And his servant said to him, Behold, there's a medium at Endor. So Saul's having to cross in enemy lines. So first of all, he's going to see someone he shouldn't be seeing, and he's crossing enemy lines, which leads us to verse 8. So he disguised himself and put on garments and went... 
he and two men with him, and they came to the woman at night and said, Divine for me by the Spirit, and bring up for me whomever I shall name to you. And the woman said to him, Surely you know that Saul, what Saul has done, how he has cut off the mediums and the necromancers from the land. Why then are you laying a trap for my life by bringing about my death? But Saul swore to her by the Lord, As the Lord lives, no punishment shall come upon you for this thing. Then the woman said, Whom shall I bring up for you? And he said, Bring up for me, Samuel. Then the woman saw Samuel. She cried out with a loud voice, and the woman said to Saul, Why have you deceived me? You are Saul. The king said to her, Do not be afraid. What do you see? And the woman said to Saul, I see a good a God coming up out of the earth. He said to her, What is his appearance? And she said, An old man coming up. And he is wrapped in a robe, and Saul knew that it was Samuel. And he bowed with his face to the ground, and he paid homage. So let's just kind of summarize this plot this far. I mean, we can't make this stuff up, amen? I mean, this is crazy. So we got Saul, king, scared to death of the Philistine army. He turns to God. God is like, I'm not talking to you. You will not hear from me. So he becomes desperate and decides to look for a medium who can communicate with the dead, specifically with the spirit of Samuel. And with the help of some friends, he finds a woman who can do the job, and she actually succeeds in calling up the spirit of Samuel from the grave. And the funny thing about this text is she seems to be as shocked as anyone. <laughs> when, when he comes and she begins to speak, it says she cried out with a loud voice when she saw the spirit of Samuel. I don't know why she screams. Scripture doesn't really tell us why she cries out. I think it's kind of funny because I think some of that stuff is all hoaxy. Okay, that's me. That's Gina's interpretation of Scripture. And I think God did a miracle here. And I think she never, I think she maybe lived a life of pretending to see spirits. But this time she really saw a spirit. And I think it shocked her out of her boots. But who knows? We don't know. Scripture doesn't tell us. I'm kind of in, interjecting that there. But whatever happened, we know she saw Samuel. And um, whether the spirit of Samuel was speaking the name of Saul as he came into view, the woman guessed that only the king himself would be able to summon the spirit of Samuel. The point is that Samuel is, that Saul is revealed. And she figures it out. And, you know, the whole context of the book combined with the message that Samuel will give to Saul, all of it seems to argue for the fact that it was God right here in this moment that created this impossible encounter. So we can sit here and conjecture all day long, but God allowed this to happen. You notice that Saul cannot see Samuel. Only the woman can see him. And it's that robe that gave him away, that robe that Hannah made for him that she replaced every year as he grew up. It's the robe that confirms his identity. Remember that second, if you want to look back up on your sheet, that second definition of desperate is involving or employing extreme measures in an attempt to escape defeat or frustration. And talk about desperation. Not only has Saul crossed enemy lines to go where he's not supposed to go, um, but the chapter reminds us twice, once in verse 3 and again in 9, that what Saul was doing was violating the very policy that he himself put into place. But he was also violating the very law of God. I put in your your, uh, sheet there a verse from Leviticus, and it says, do not turn to mediums or necromancers. Do not seek them out, and so make yourselves unclean by them. I, I am the Lord your God. Wow. That's powerful. And I want to tell you today, ladies, the Lord our God does not want us messing with stuff like that. He does not want us messing with horoscopes and predictions and things of this nature. He says, I am the Lord your God. I heard someone say one time, don't worship the stars, worship the creator of the stars. 
let him rule and reign in your life. So even though Saul had earlier said it was wrong, and more importantly, God has said it was wrong, Saul still wants the woman to call up Samuel's spirit. And I will tell you, ladies, that this right here is great desperation. And is this what desperation does to us? Does it tempt us to do the very things we know are wrong? Are the extreme measures that desperation employs us always extreme in the sense that they turn into disobedience to God in our lives? Have you ever said this, what else, what else can I do but steal? What else can I do but lie? What else can I do but kick him back or give him or her a piece of my mind? What else can I do but step into this situation and try to fix it and make it better and put my two cents in and control and pull and work? Those are all signs of of desperation. As creepy as this scene is, it's just creepy. I'm sorry. This is creepy. It's scary. It's eerie. We need to listen uh, to the one, Samuel, <laughs> and what he has to say to Saul. So let's read on, starting in 15. So Samuel said to Saul, Why have you disturbed me by bringing me up? And Saul answered, I am in great distress, for the Philistines are warring against me, and God has turned away from me and answers me no more, either by prophets or by dreams. Therefore, I have summoned you to tell me what I shall do. And Samuel said, Why then? Do you ask me, since the Lord has turned away from you and become your enemy? The Lord has done to you as he spoke by me, for the Lord has torn the kingdom out of your hand and given it to your neighbor, David, because you did not obey the voice of the Lord and did not carry out his fierce wrath against Amalek. Therefore, the Lord has done this thing to you this day. You know, there's nothing really new here. This is exactly what Samuel told Saul back in chapters 13 and 15 because Saul failed to obey God on many occasions and God rejected Saul. God was not listening to Saul now because Saul did not listen to God earlier. And the very guidance that Saul now desired is the very guidance he rejected in chapters 13 and 15. And what should be most shocking to us is not that Saul went to a medium. That that should not be the most shocking thing in this text. But that after all this time, Saul still does not get it. That is the most shocking thing of this text. He still does not get it. So after rejecting God and being rejected by God, after trying for so long to kill David, an innocent man... After experiencing such tension with the son Jonathan, who was loyal to David, and after presiding over the genocide in Nob, in the city of the priests, after killing, almost being killed by David, not once, but twice, and after being tormented by an evil spirit, Saul still does not get it. I think Saul's desperation is what I think we need to call today a worldly desperation. Saul believes that because things are so bad that he has to disobey and do the wrong thing in order to accomplish the greater good. I want you to let that word sink in your head just a little bit. We're going to come back to that, the greater good. Because for Saul, it's clear that the greater good was about not about accomplishing God's will but about defeating the Philistines. So in light of all actions, I think we could say that worldly desperation is the belief that things are so hopeless that I must turn to drastic measures, even sin and disobedience, as my only hope. Ladies, when I was working through this study, man, this, this, this got me. I see myself here. Isn't this what we all can be guilty of? We look around us and believe that things are so messed up. That situations and relationships are so irreparably broken. 
that circumstances and finances are so tight, so tense, so terrible, that we must say or do things that we later have to rationalize. We tell ourselves and others, and maybe even God, but I thought I was desperate. What else can I do? I think of the story of Rebecca and Jacob and Esau. Boy, howdy, Rebecca was so full of worldly desperation. She wanted so much for her favorite child, Jacob. She lied and schemed. Destroyed the family almost over it. She was so desperate to get what she wanted. My children, I have a phrase at my house that if I say this first word, they will finish it for you. I just say the word scheming, and they will say, is not faith. And I've taught them this growing up, that our flesh, our heart, our desires, our dreams that we had as women, especially my young girls, they're going to want to make you jump ahead of God. And that can be worldly desperation because sometimes you get so far ahead of where God wants you. You're so desiring of that thing that's out there that you think will make your life better or make you happier that you really bypass the Lord and His plan for your life. This chapter reminds us that our most desperate times should always direct our attention back to our desperate condition before God, ladies. And that's what Samuel did for Saul. He pretty much put it back and said, Buddy, you are in a desperate place before God. Another Saul, later called Paul, let us tells us something similar about our standing before God. He writes in Romans 3, What then? Are we Jews any better off? No, not at all, for we have already charged that all, both Jews and Greeks, are under sin. As it is written, none is righteous, no, not one. No one understands, no one seeks for God. All have turned aside, together they have become worthless. No one is good, not even one. And this is a picture of our desperate condition before the Lord God. And like Saul, haven't we all turned away from God in the midst of desperate times, when those desperate times should have been turned, should have turned us to God and said, anybody? Oh, I know I have so many times. We think we, we think we can figure it out, don't we? I, I know I do. I think in my mind, I know how I want this to end. But the hard part is trusting the Lord and letting Him do it. I know we probably in the, aren't in the habit of calling up the dead or, or seeking wisdom from the dead. But you know, sometimes we, we'll seek wisdom from a friend who is not a believer. And you think about that. Their spirit is dead. We have to be very careful where we go to when we're desperate, who we talk to, who we're getting our wisdom from, our counsel from. I want to set just four truths as I wrap this up today in our heart this morning. Just things that we can take from this text and maybe chew on this week. Truth number one, we need our desperate times to lead us not to worldly desperation, but to holy desperation. If, if you fast forward with me to chapter 30, and in chapter 30 we learn more about desperate times because David and his 600 men had just discovered that their wives and children had been carried off by the Amalekites. And this is what we read in verse 4 and 6 of 30. Then David and the people who were with him raised their voices and wept until they had no more strength to weep. That is some serious bawling going on. They are wrecked. They are broken. They are crushed. He is desperate. And it says, And David was greatly distressed, for the people spoke of stoning him, because all the people were bitter in soul, each for his sons and daughters. But David strengthened himself in the Lord his God. 
What we see here is David's response is completely opposite of Saul's. What we've been given here is a beautiful picture of holy desperation. And we can say that holy desperation is the belief that I am so hopeless that I must turn to God as my only hope. You see, desperation, ladies, can be a good thing when it turns us not to spirits of dead men or the things of this world, but to a loving, merciful God, a God who is faithful and true. And David himself described this holy desperation in Psalm when he wrote, Hear my prayer, O Lord. Give ear to my pleas for mercy in your faithfulness. Answer me in your righteousness. Enter not into judgment with your servant, for no one living is righteous before you. For the enemy has pursued my soul. He has crushed my life to the ground. He has made me sit in darkness like those long dead. Therefore my spirit faints within me. My heart within me is appalled. I remember the days of old. I meditate on all that you have done. I ponder the work of your hands. I stretch out my hands to you. My soul thirsts for you like a parched land. Answer me quickly, O Lord. My spirit fails. Hide not your face from me, lest I be like those who go down to the pit. Let me hear you in the morning. Let me hear of your steadfast love, for in you I trust. Make me know the way I should go, for I lift up my soul. A prayer like this is just the result of a holy desperation. This is what is pouring out of David from a heart that gets what a holy desperation truly is. So truth number two. When desperate times lead to holy desperation, it expresses itself in how you pray and how you read God's Word. When I pray as one who recognizes I am hopeless and must turn to God, my prayers are not just these rote prayers or formulas that I go through every morning. But my prayers truly, I'm telling you where I have been In most recent months, my prayers have been a pleading with God. God, not my will, but your will be done. When I read God's word as one who recognizes I am hopeless and must turn to God, my time in scripture is not simply completing a task or a check, a box off a list, but it's it's a holy desperation that leads me to the word of God that is living and active. It is the bread of life. It is where I get the living water into my dry, thirsty soul. When you are desperate and you are in a place of holy desperation, your prayer and Bible study, they're all you have. Someone asked me one time, time, how do you get up out of bed so early every morning? I was like, I'm just desperate. I'm just desperate. Key truth number three. When worldly desperation is all that defines us, desperate times will simply multiply. multiply. Let's read these final verses, 19 through 25. Moreover, the Lord will give Israel also with you into the hand of the Philistines. And tomorrow you and your sons shall be with you. The Lord will give the army of Israel also into the hand of the Philistines. Then Saul fell on his fell at once full length on the ground filled with fear because of the words of Samuel. And there was no strength in him, for he had eaten nothing all day and night. And the woman came to Saul, and when she saw that he was terrified, she said to him, Behold, your servant has obeyed you. I have taken my life in my hand and have listened to what you have said to me. Now therefore you also obey your servant. Let me set a morsel of bread before you and eat, that you may have strength when you go on your way. He refused and said, I will not eat. But his servants together with the woman urged him, and he listened to their words. So he rose from the earth and sat on the bed. Now the woman had a fattened calf in the house, and she quickly killed it, and she took flour and kneaded it and baked unleavened bread with it. And she put it before Saul and his servants, and they ate. Then they rose and went away that night. Perhaps his last meal. Here is Saul, the once great king, 
who stood head and shoulders above every Israelite. Here is Saul stretched out on the ground in fear and the dirt for the fortune teller's hut. A fortune teller's hut, the king of Israel. And for God, this was, this was the final straw. God had already made clear in his word in Leviticus 26, if a person turns to mediums or necromancers pouring after them, I will set my face against that person and I will cut them off from among my people. Truth number four, there is great blessing that comes from considering a God-forsaken man. And when the sixth hour had come, there was darkness over the whole land until the ninth hour. And at the ninth hour, Jesus cried with a loud voice, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani, which means, my God, my God, why, why have you forsaken me? The beauty of the gospel, ladies, is that God's Son went through darkness and the horror, the horror of God's absence for us, the sheer agony of God's forsakenness on the cross, and he died, was buried, and rose again, conquering death forever so that we, his daughters, would never, ever be forsaken. Amen? He promises he will never leave us or forsake us. If we find ourselves today in a desperate situation, and I just want to clarify that, it may be one of your own making. It may be one that you had no power over. Whatever. We serve a God who is Redeemer. He is the restorer of the broken, and He promises to make all things new. That is the gospel of Jesus Christ. And we have a choice today. We can choose to believe that gospel in our circumstance, in our desperate circumstance or not. He either has us or he doesn't. He doesn't kind of have us. He either does or he doesn't. Do you find yourself in a desperate situation this morning? If you do, I want to encourage you by saying that times of suffering and pain are really how we come to fully uh, know Christ more, more of Him. And He wants to show us He's got this. Whatever this is for you, He's got this. He wants our surrendered hearts, ladies. He wants our surrendered desires. He wants our surrendered dreams. He wants our surrendered disappointments. He wants us to relinquish control of whatever this is. He wants it. The path of worldly desperation only leads us further from God, but holy desperation leads us closer to Jesus. Amen? And when we realize that He is all we have, we know He's all we need. I want to close today with a quote from the late, great Elizabeth Elliot is so beautiful, and she says, The deepest things that I have learned in my own life have come from the deepest suffering. And out of the deepest waters and out of the hottest fires have come the deepest things that I know about God. May this be said of all of us. Today. Father, I'm in awe of you, of your word. It is so incredibly amazing. These ladies are so unaware that this really was a word for me today. I share that with them. This was a word for me. Thank you that you were so good and kind and loving that you would put me in this place this day to study this text because you needed to speak something into my heart. And I am wrecked by that kind of love. But I thank you. 
And I pray that these words this morning have landed in hearts that really needed it. Lord, I truly believe there is a woman in this room, or maybe several, that are in places of their worldly desperate. They are grabbing and grasping and clawing, and they just need to let it go. So, sisters, I pray over you this morning that you will just speak to the Lord right now in this in the quietness of your seat. I say, Jesus, this is yours. I give it up. You have it. Take it. I surrender this. Whatever this is, I surrender this to you today. And just say to the Lord this morning, Father, I trust you. I trust you. I trust you with my marriage. I trust you with my children. I trust you with my finances. I trust you with my future. I trust you. And I will lean into you today, Father. Lord, we bless you. We bless your holy name. And we thank you for meeting here with us today. And it's in the precious and wonderful name of Jesus we pray. Amen. Wow, what a powerful message. I don't think there's anything I can add to that except to say that I hope all of you will spend some time this week. I know I have some soul searching to do about whether we're walking day by day in, in worldly desperation or in holy desperation. I think as followers of Christ, it doesn't mean we're immune to those worldly desperate, desperate leanings. And so um, the person of Jesus Christ in his life shows us that there has to be death for there to be life. And we have to be broken in order to grow and be the women of God that he's calling us to be. Wow, what a powerful message. Thank you, friend. <coughs> Ladies, have a, have a blessed week that is filled with desperation for our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. See you next week.